Well, hey there. I'm making this video today because a colleague of mine asked me to do a little research to see if there's a way to detect greenhouse gases on the super cheap. I mean, so cheap that you can put these sensors all over the, the place, on the top of power poles, near factories, um, near volcanoes exploding and spewing gases into the air. And to, so you can get a good sense of what's going on um, with greenhouse gas production and if there's anything we can do to mitigate that. And in just a moment, we're going to learn what the stuff in this neon sign has to do with gas detection. All right, here's the big question. How in the world do we determine where all these greenhouse gases are coming from accurately and where they're going? And if we make changes, how in the world do we know that it's, it's helping? Did that tree that my landlord planted right where I want to park my car make any difference? I want to know. All right, so some of these gases are very hard to detect because they're very sparse in the atmosphere. For instance, CO2 is only 388 parts per million. It doesn't sound like a lot, but unfortunately the CO... Well, okay, fortunately also, um, CO2 is very good at what it does. It absorbs infrared energy. Photons come from our sun in the visible spectrum, hit the Earth, the Earth absorbs it, re-emits infrared energy, CO2 absorbs that, turns it to heat. If we didn't have the atmosphere, it would be a very cold place. Um, so thank goodness for some uh, greenhouse gases also. Now the, the mechanism of a molecule that absorbs um, infrared energy is based on the, the mass of the atoms in the molecule and the bonds so they have a natural resonance. They like to resonate at a particular frequency by these factors, the, the atoms and the bonds. And, and when a photon of a harmonic frequency or the fundamental strikes these atoms, it causes them to vibrate more and generate heat. One highly accurate way to determine what's in your atmosphere is to use a mass spectrometer. A mass spectrometer plots out the mass of every atom and molecule from lightest to heaviest and by doing this you can get a fingerprint of what is in your sample. The way they work is they're under a high vacuum so the whole apparatus is pumped down with very expensive vacuum pumps, turbo pumps, mechanical pumps, diffusion pumps, extremely expensive and hard to maintain. To get your sample in, you have a dual skimmer cone configuration on many devices, which have very tiny holes in the cones that skim off a little air, and then the majority of the air that's skimmed through the first cone is pumped away, and then there's a secondary cone with a higher differential vacuum in here, which pulls a few more molecules through. Those molecules are immediately met by a filament or a high voltage electrode that ionizes the source, and when you ionize the source, you add or subtract electrons. Um, that's how we get to the neon sign. A neon sign is ionized neon. And uh, once you have an ionized um, sample, you can start to move it around with different potential voltages, and you can start focusing it through rings and accelerate this into a, a beam and add energy to it and make this tightly focused beam that leaves your ionization so source. The next step is to analyze it. There's two ways that we can do this. There's a sector analyzer, which is a hollow tube with a huge electromagnet around it that bends the beam. Heavier molecules tend to go in a straight line. Lighter ones will curve more. And by varying the magnetic field or the acceleration voltage, how fast you push these ions through. You can choose which ions you want to look at. You can also fine-tune it by moving a slit at the very end of this tube where you can select the ion that you want to look at. And down in the detector stage there's many strategies for detecting the ions. There's secondary electron emissions, there's scintillators. Um, and by sweeping this magnetic field or sweeping the acceleration volt or moving this the slit, you can map out the mass of everything in your sample. So we're going to go to my garage and we're going to look at some of the 
the sector analyzer um, stuff that I've been hoarding. Okay, this is the ionization stage. The ions come through that little ring in the middle. There's the vacuum port pointing out to the side. There's some cooling lines there to keep this cool. And then that's the skimmer cone. That all bolts to this assembly, which is the acceleration. This has disks that are stacked up with higher and higher potential, and they accelerate the ions into a beam, which then that bolts onto this, which is the sector analyzer. The beam comes down through a huge electromagnet that's not shown and get analyzed, and then the detector bolts on the back side. I'm going to demonstrate with a CRT, since it's very similar, it has acceleration, but it accelerates electrons instead to the front and forms a spot on the front, and then they get swept away. When I was a kid, we watched TV on CRTs. Here's an oscilloscope with a single spot in the, the center. So the electron beams are striking the center. And when I put a rare earth magnet, it bends just like the ions would in a sector analyzer. All right, so looking at the mass analyzer, we're definitely not going to be hanging that from a telephone pole. So we need to find some other option that's a little bit lighter. And the quadrupole mass analyzer definitely would be a smaller option. I really love this type of um, mass analyzer. It's really cool. The way it works is there's four rods that are 90 degrees apart and the ions shoot down the middle. Two of the rods have positive charges and two of them have negative charges. If we split this assembly apart and just analyze it, how the rods interact with the different ions, we can see how one will work as a low-pass filter and one will work as a high-pass filter. Um, so if these are both positively charged and our ions are positively charged and we send them down the middle of these rods, they're going to be repelled from the rods and they, they won't crash into the rods, they'll just go straight down the center. Now if we add a small AC um, current to this that causes these rods to dip to a negative bias, just part of this phase, the ions will be drawn in towards the rods and so we send the small ions in, they'll be drawn towards the rod, but then when it's positive for most of the phase, they'll snap right back to the middle, and then they'll be drawn in and snap back. They'll, they'll zigzag through here, but they'll make it through. The heavy ions, since they move very slow, they'll get into this death spiral. They, they just can't get away. They won't snap back to the middle, and eventually they'll crash and burn right into the rod. So that filters out heavy ions. Now if we have two rods, the other two that fit in here, with negative bias, and we analyze how those work, the most of the period of the alternating current that's applied to them, the it's negative, so it's drawing ions in. So the light ions will quickly get sucked into the rod and, and crash and burn, where the heavy ones will slowly move over, but they won't ever crash into the rods. So that is your light filter. Combine those two and get the right biasing. You can make a window that you can sweep through your, your masses. By sweeping those alternating currents, you can detect each of these spikes and all the isotopes. And back to the garage. Let's take a look at some of my junk. Okay, you can see a quadrupole here. The ions shoot right down the middle. You still have to use the same skimmer, ionization, acceleration, and detector stages. You can even cascade for um, higher precision, uh, a sector analyzer also. Um, so we're not quite where we need to be. Hang tight. Watch the next video. There's going to be a link here somewhere. Boop, boop, boop. And um, I look forward to your comments. Maybe you guys have some uh, suggestions, um, some advice. If you're an expert in this area, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm Jerry Ellsworth, and thanks for watching. Be sure to watch the second video.